thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, so I, I put this talk together because I, I really wanted to kind of uh, bring some awareness to some of the kind of newer technologies and newer um, things that are available in the world of cryptography as, as kind of solutions to uh, non-traditional problems. And so we'll kind of go over what that means here in a minute. Um, but uh, what we'll be talking about is some of these things that are on the screen there. If you've heard of things like format preserving encryption or searchable encryption, these are all things that we're going to cover at a, at a high level because uh, some of them involve a great deal of math. Um, but the, the idea is just to understand kind of what options are out there in order to kind of see what may uh, be appropriate for use cases that you're working with as far as with, you know, applications that need uh, cryptography but don't fit well into the kind of traditional model. So who am I? Um, so I'm uh, based in, in Maryland. Um, I'm an advisor for Ubic Security. And uh, I'm also the, was the creator of the OWASP Broken Web Apps Project, which uh, still I need to kind of pick up and dust off at some point. But uh, sometimes I go to the uh, Northern Virginia or DC or Maryland uh, meetings. And uh, my favorite food, if you're wondering, nachos. And then uh, if you're wondering who Ubic is, uh, we're actually a, a partner with OWASP. We have a, basically a, a relationship where we um, do some kind of co-marketing, but also we have some benefits for OWASP members. So um, Ubic is a kind of application layer encryption key management, managed key management. Um, so you can get some, some free pro tier features and, and some good pricing uh, just using your OWASP email address if you're an OWASP member. So uh, definitely check it out at the URL there. So when you think about encryption generally, uh, what the kind of things that you normally learn in, you know, computer science classes or, you know, CISSP back in uh, the day when I went through that anyway, was really, you know, kind of traditional encryption design where, you know, you're kind of taking in some amount of plain text and you just kind of spit out some random looking data. You know, the idea, you know, the really the use case was there was no way to tell anything about the plain text based on looking at the cipher text. That was kind of a design feature. And it was also a design feature that it wanted to be non-deterministic, meaning that you can encrypt the same data multiple times and you're going to get different output. And, and the way that's done generally is through a, an initialization vector. So if you're familiar with, uh, this is the cipher block chaining mode, where you've got an initialization vector here that's basically being kind of XORed in with the plain text as a way of basically kind of bootstrapping the process uh, with random data. And it uh, gives you that kind of non-deterministic nature in order to give resistance to certain types of cryptanalysis. And, uh, but, but it also results in kind of, you know, ciphertext that's not ideal um, for some ways of handling anyway. So it's, it's generally binary data. So even if you start with text, you're going to end up with, you know, binary data on the output. Um, it's usually going to be larger than the original plain text um, because you've got, you know, an IV, you've got padding, um, and uh, if you need to encode that data, so if you've like had text originally, it gets turned into binary data, then you need to either you know hex encode it or base64 encode it, then that's going to make it even longer. So you know it, it, it's not uh, it's not ideal for for most ways of handling. And then you know the the one exception you might have there is sometimes it ends up being smaller if there's compression involved. So sometimes uh, you know schemes, especially if you're dealing with text, will compress the data before it gets encrypted. And that will result in then the, the cipher text being smaller than the, the plain text, which can also lead to strange problems in some situations. So what we're really going to be looking at is just different ways to kind of break that paradigm. So, you know, this is kind of the traditional encryption, and we're going to be looking at, you know, non-traditional encryptions. And so we're kind of going to go through different um, mechanisms as far as kind of the solutions, uh, but also introduce kind of the problems that they solve in a way, uh, you know, sometimes one way or the other. So the, the first uh, thing that we uh, are going to talk about is format preserving encryption. So the idea of format preserving encryption is that you want to maintain the format and length of your original data. So a very common example for this would be something like a credit card number. So credit card number is going to be 16 digits. And uh, if you want to do format preserving encryption on it, you're going to convert that into another 16 digit number. So I mean, technically, you know, a block cipher is also a way of doing that because you're translating, you know, bits to bits. But um, if you're familiar with, you know, computer science, like the counting problem or pigeonhole problem, you know, there, there needs to be a one-to-one -one mapping because there's exactly as many cipher texts as there are plain texts. So, you know, the, there, there's that kind of mapping, and it also needs to be reversible. So there needs to be a way that you can, you know, get back to the plain text as well. 
So, so how do you do that? Well, um, as a kind of a conceptual example, let's start with you know, just thinking about digits and you know, kind of take each digit uh, on its own. You know, in this case, you know, we're actually using digits, but you could you know, just assign numbers to letters or whatever other kind of values that you might have. And, uh, and what we're just going to do is combine that with a, a cryptographic uh, pseudo-random number generator. So you can use uh, a lot of uh, FPE and other schemes use you know, AES and things like that underneath the hood in order to provide some of the, uh, the cryptographic guarantees. And so you can use AES to, to generate a, you know, a secure um, pseudo-random number um, stream. And then you can just combine that. So um, in this case, we're just going to take, you know, simple arithmetic uh, modulo n, in this case, which is, you know, 9. So we can say, okay, so for every digit here, you can see we're kind of doing this um, encryption up and down. So the plain text was 1. Our PRNG spit out a 4. And so we add those together. We get 5. 2 plus 9 gives you 1 when you're going modulo 9, and so on and so forth. So... The idea here is that you're um, basically going to get, um, I should say modulo 10, actually, sorry. Um, so the idea here is that we're um, getting this, and, it, and it's completely reversible. So um, because, you know, addition and subtraction are basically opposites, um, you know, you're still going to have the same pseudo-random stream coming when you try to do the decryption, and you just have to kind of work up, you know. So it's say, okay, 5 minus 4 equals 1. 1 minus 9 gives you negative, so we would say, okay, 11 minus 9, and that gives us 2. 5 minus 1 is 4, and that's how you can basically regenerate back the stream. So this is an, uh, a way that you could conceivably do something like format-preserving encryption. Um, so um, how, how it's actually done is a, a little bit more complicated. There's a couple kind of algorithms that are used. Um, mo most commonly, you're going to see FF1 and FF3-1. There are a couple other... Um, ones there that are kind of not recommended anymore. Um, and as I mentioned before, they use, these use a block cipher as part of the encryption process. And they also use what's called a tweak, which is, I don't know why they call it a tweak. It's basically like a pepper or a salt, you know, where it's, you know, the same across all the different um, things that are being encrypted, but it's not something that needs to be um, protected. It doesn't need to be secret. The, the tweak can be kind of public. And uh, when you're encrypting this data, what you're going to find is that um, you're co basically converting it from kind of an arbitrary space to, to the same thing. And I can show a little bit of the, the details on that on the next slide. There's also um, some, there are some security concerns when you have too small of a uh, key space, or a, a space of, of possible values, that is. So one of the things they've uh, originally, bo both of these algorithms and some of the other FF algorithms were you know, thought to be secure with like a hundred different values, but in reality, it, uh, they, they now recommend a, a, a million, actually. And so that doesn't mean you need an actual million values. It just means that if you're going to have, you know, um, you know, in the case of, of a digit, you have, you know, 10 possible values. It just means you would need to have at least, you know, six digits, basically, in order to have a million possible values. So it's just the, the radix, which is the, the size of the, uh, the number of values that you have, and then uh, raised to the power of the minimum length. Um, one thing to be concerned about if you are looking at this area is that FF1 has some patent claims on it. Uh, I don't know if those have really been adjudicated as far as if they're legit or not, but there's at least some people that claim to have patents on that. Um, FF3-1 does not, so that's generally kind of where people steer towards. Um, and if you're, if you're working in, in Asia or South Korea specifically, they've actually got a couple other algorithms that they recommend, FEA1 and FEA2, which uh, I won't get into the details there. But it is one of those areas where you know, you do sometimes have to deal with kind of different regional requirements for, for storing data. So the reality of how these things work is uh, they're what's called a Feistel cipher. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that concept, but it's the, the same type of cipher that, uh, you know, AES and DES and things like that are as well. The, the gist of it is that it's, you know, some number of rounds that, that kind of uh, basically are repeated. And what happens is that in each round, it takes kind of half of the plain text data and does some sort of transform on it, and then XORs in the, the other half of the, the data that's there. And so um, this is the reason why um, something like uh, AES is a, is a, is a uh, Feistel um, cipher, and it uses 128-bit block length. And that was because when they were kind of designing the, uh, you know, putting out the request for proposals back 
way back when, they were kind of forward thinking and saying, okay, 64-bit processors are going to come, and the, the characteristics of Feistel uh, um, ciphers are such that they're guaranteed to be reversible. So the actual transform on the, the first half does not need to be reversible in order for the whole thing to be reversible. So it's actually you know, very good for building crypto systems. That's why so many of them, including this, use it. And so um, AES, they said, okay, we're going to have 64-bit processors, so therefore each half will be 64 bits. That's why they chose a 128-bit block length. And that's why you're going to have the same block size regardless even of what your key size is. So as you go through, you're, you're basically XORing the uh, different sides, and it goes through some number of rounds. The number of rounds varies um, for FF1. It's uh, eight rounds, I believe. FF3-1 is 10 rounds. They also split the input slightly differently, um, so that's why there's kind of these differences between the, the two algorithms. But the general concept is the same, and then they also the, the general concept also is that you, know, you can basically work backwards. So this uh, left-hand column is your encryption, um, where you're basically taking the plain text and turning it into ciphertext, and your right hand is, is the opposite. So you start out with round zero and back up here to get to the, the plain text. So that's the, the gist of how those things work. But the, uh, the importance is not so much the details of the algorithms, but more just the concepts that these things exist, and it's, it's an option. So in the past, I think a lot of people, when they looked at credit card numbers, they always thought about, like, well, we need to tokenize it, and we need to build some sort of map that we remember kind of what the original value was and what the tokenized value was. And uh, these types of um, format-preserving encryption allow you to not have to do that. So you can basically never have to store the unencrypted value. You're able to basically just store the encrypted value and the key just like you would with any other um, ciphertext. Okay, so next thing we're going to talk about is deterministic encryption. So what this means is basically that, you know, you're going to get the same ciphertext uh, as long as you provide the same plain text and the key. And so what this does is it breaks what we talked about before with the, the initialization vector. There's, you know, intentionally no randomization here. Um, you can't, sometimes there'll be like a fixed initialization vector for, for reasons, but um, the idea is that it's, it's not randomized. So that way, every time you, you run the encryption, you're going to get the same result. And so, you know, it kind of breaks that, uh, you know, Boromir's uh, advice here where it's like, well, no, we actually do encrypt the same message, uh, multiple messages with the same key um, because this actually kind of gives you um, properties that are useful in some cases. So, well, what are those properties? Why would you want to do this? Well, it's primarily in databases. So MongoDB calls this client-side field-level encryption. You know, other databases call it something similar. But the basic idea is that you're, you're providing it a, um, a way that you can say, okay, we're going to encrypt this data, but we want it stored in such a way that we can still run at least a little bit of querying against it. So, you know, you could deterministically encrypt a social security number, for example. And because every time you encrypt the social security number, you're going to get the same ciphertext, then that can then be used as a primary key and even used to, like, join across tables and things like that. It gives you a lot of uh, characteristics that you don't get with, uh, you know, traditionally encrypted data. So the, the idea there is you're basically just encrypting the data before you search. So the database is really not even so much aware that what's happening because it's, you know, all it's doing is getting some data. It treats it as a primary key. Um, the, the actual kind of encryption and decryption is all happening on the client side. So um, it's, it only allows, you know, direct equality or, or kind of joins and those kind of queries, but it does allow you some level of um, being able to secure things on, in a way that's uh, not going to be just completely using the, the plain text data. So it's a way that you can kind of compromise sometimes between, okay, we've got social security number, which is a very good identifier to use for people in, you know, general kind of HR or healthcare, or whatever kind of systems, but you don't want to store that in an unencrypted form. So we kind of treat that encrypted SSN as the, the kind of primary key across various tables and whatnot. So the, the problem is it's, you know, there's low entropy. Um, or Well, it's, it's susceptible to crypt analysis. I imagine a lot of people have probably seen this picture before, which is uh, basically using uh, uh, ECB, electronic code book um, encryption, on a uh, picture that you can tell is, uh, you know, the Linux Penguin. The idea is that that's a deterministic protocol, so every you know section of these things that was just you know a, a block of, of white 
uh, pixels uh, gets encrypted to the same value. All the black pixels get encrypted to the same value, and that's why you can kind of see the outline and whatnot. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a great illustration of that. It's also very um, uh, problematic in low entropy fields. So when you've got something like age or blood type, gender, um, age again, <laughs> country, eye color, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, basically there's only going to be so many values that it can be, and then you can start drawing inferences just by the fact that a certain, uh, the probability, the um, frequency analysis across things. So age, for example, you know, you can compare um, a, you know, age in some encrypted data with, you know, our chart here that shows the uh, U.S. population by age and, you know, get a pretty good idea maybe of at least what are the, you know, older people because they're in the smaller cohorts and, uh, you know, the, the more, uh, you know, people that are more middle-aged and, and whatnot. Um, depending on the demographics of your application or whatever's being analyzed, you know, that may also affect, you know, things. So if you're looking at TikTok, for example, the age would definitely skew towards younger, and that would allow you to probably make some pretty good inferences there. Um, and especially if you've got multiple fields that are that are encrypted in this way, then it can it can really cause you problems because then you can start correlating things like okay, you know the the country that someone is in and their eye color, you know that in certain countries certain eye colors are more common, and that'll allow you to basically kind of basic you can kind of think of it as like one of those kind of logic puzzles of like okay, eventually you can kind of figure out everything as as far as kind of uh, who's what, but. That's assuming someone has access, you know, full access to your database to do arbitrary queries and whatnot. So it's ultimately what you want to protect against. But if the alternative is I'm going to have to store all this data unencrypted, then this, you're certainly, you know, improving your security. And there's some other techniques we'll get to later that can, that can improve on this a little bit. But, uh, there's, they have issues as well. So, you know, all of these, all of these solutions and, you know, the problems that they solve is, it's, it's, it's about compromise. You know, it's like understanding that, we're, we're kind of relaxing some of the security constraints on these uh, crypto systems in order to give us more flexibility in, in what we want to do. So um, another item that's, uh, that's of interest is what's called searchable encryption. So, I mean, we talked in the last one how deterministic encryption allows you to um, gather, uh, you know, to do searches on equality. So this is a, a bit similar, but it's, it's not quite the same. The, the problem space here is more along the lines of, uh, you know, documents. So we've got a, a collection of documents, maybe that have some sensitive information in it, and you want to be able to search for keywords across those documents, but you don't want to be storing any of that in plain text. So uh, what we want to do then is, uh, okay, you know, before we encrypt the document, we're going to extract a list of keywords, and then we're going to then encrypt the, the, each of those keywords um, along with a, a reference to the document, and uh, you know, that all gets pushed to the database along with the actual encrypted document, and that gives us the ability then to later query on those encrypted um, keywords and pull back the document. So the keywords are, are going to be deterministically encrypted in this case because they need to be able to match up, but the documents don't necessarily need to be. So you can have um, variable keys on that. So it's, it's really kind of separating out the encryption of the, the kind of bulk data, like the entire document, from the, the keywords that are used for the querying and searching. So... Again, the client is the only one that has the keys to any of this stuff, so the database uh, server is basically just uh, storing all this data in an encrypted form. And uh, what you do run into, again, is, is kind of frequency analysis. So, you know, there's going to be some common words that, uh, you know, if, if you're, it depends on how you're extracting keywords, you might ignore some of the very common words, but, you know, Things like your name of your company and, and other things, you know, related to your business are probably going to be very common and, you know, be kind of able to be identified as someone who's able to kind of dump all of the keywords and figure out, uh, you know, this is kind of the occurrences of them across different documents. So, so that's one part of the problem. Um, but again, you're, you know, again, you're, you're making trade-offs here. 
The, the other kind of thing to think about is, is kind of the low frequency thing. So if you've got, you know, a, a very kind of innovative solution to something, something you're patenting, something like that, maybe a merger and acquisition that's, uh, you know, kind of out of the norm, I guess, for your normal day to day operations, then that may have kind of more unique keywords. And so that may sing, sing, symbolize to somebody who's looking at it that this is an interesting document because it has a lot of, you know, unique keywords or keywords that are not seen in other documents. Now, granted, they still can't decrypt the document, so it's a you know you can argue how how useful that is, but it's at least maybe you know gives them some information. Again, kind of making that trade off. So, so one way you can address that, and uh, I had a couple slides here to go into more detail, but I decided to uh, kind of keep this at high level, which is that you you can actually make this a little better by. Um, maintaining an index of, of basically how many times you've seen each keyword. So rather than hashing it to, to the same thing every time, you're going to have a unique hash every time you see the keyword, which then requires that you're going to do some work, um, you know, when you insert to know how many, you know, what uh, index you should be at for each of the keywords. But it, it does work out where you can have this that, uh, that you don't necessarily have this frequency analysis. So if you want to see a lot more detail on that, there's a presentation here from, uh, um, from the uh, Chaos Computer Club uh, that goes into more detail about kind of how this works. But the basic idea is that you've got a um, in incrementation there that's going to basically keep it from being a, a repeatable encryption. And, and this is also one of those situations where, um, as far as I know, there's no commercial kind of solutions that currently implement this. So if you wanted to do a, a scenario like this, you're going to have to basically do it yourself. Whereas um, I mentioned earlier for like the, just deterministic, deterministic encryption for, um, for a single field, like that's something that most databases support already. Okay. So another, another thing you might have heard of before is what's called homomorphic encryption. And it's, um, it's kind of a strange uh, animal as far as I'm not quite sure how it got the name. I think it has to do with more um, some of the mathematical properties. But the basic idea is that it, um, it's generally when you think about homomorphic encryption, you're thinking about like integers or some sort of numbers. And what you can do is you can take the encrypted data and you can perform operations on it in such a way that the, um, the, uh, the resulting kind of uh, ciphertext is going to be the equivalent of performing those operations before the encryption. So the simple example here was as addition. So you've got um, you've got A and B that you might want to encrypt, and so I'm um, sorry, A and B that you want to add together. So you can one way you could do that is you could take A and you could take B, add them together, and then encrypt them. But the other way you can do it in this case is you could take A and encrypt it, put it in the database. Later, at some later time, take B and encrypt it, send that to the database. The database then adds the two together, and it's guaranteed to be the same as if you had added them before you sent them or through the encryption process. So it's, uh, I've got an example here on the next slide that'll kind of go into a little bit of how this can work. It generally is, um, you know, gonna, there's gonna be some limitations on it, um, some significant limitations that we'll talk about in a few slides. But it's uh, practical there. It's, um, you can, it's commonly done with things like RSA, where you've got uh, exponentiation happening. So um, if you're doing you know, modular exponentiation, you can then do multiplication across that in such a way that you can guarantee that the, the properties uh, that we're talking about here. So you could also think about string manipulation as being kind of homomorphic encryption. So if you had an encryption scheme where you like encrypted every single character separately, then you could certainly do concatenation of two strings together because you're, you know, basically just putting them together in that way. So, um, but generally when you're talking about homomorphic, you're talking about addition and multiplication as the, the primary operations. And, and even though division is, you know, technically multiplication, generally these things are working on integers. So doing like integer division is not, uh, simple in these cases. So you might be able to in some cases. There's also some cases where, um, you can actually do uh, homomorphic encryption for uh, real numbers, for you know fractions uh, or decimal numbers, I should say. But what what ends up happening is that it's basically an approximation. So what you end up with is that you know if you've uh, the encrypted value is not exactly the same as the uh, as the you know the a times encrypt a times encrypt b is not exactly the same as encrypt a times b, 
but it's close enough by you know some delta that that's uh, practical for some purposes anyway. So let's just go through a little bit of an example on this one. So um, the real uh, so just kind of going down the column here. So let's say we've got a plain text of three and we've got a key of 12, and, and we're just gonna use a very simple kind of example cipher scheme where it's like we're just gonna multiply the plain text times the, the key, sorry. So we see here that the uh, cipher text now is 36, three times 12 is 36. Now we wanna add five to that, so because the 36 was already stored on the server, we need to take the five and multiply it by 12, five times 12 is 60, that gives us uh, 60 that would then get sent to the server and added to our 36 previously. So that gives us a total of 96. So the encrypted data after you know the second piece was sent would be 96. Um, you can then say, okay, well 96 is gonna later then get sent back to the client, which then knows the key and can decrypt the data. So 96 divided by 12 is eight. And lo and behold, that's you know three plus five is eight. So this is basically showing kind of how this can work in a you know, very simple case. Um, you know, and I, and I kind of walk through here a couple more you know, larger numbers where it still kind of works out. Uh, what you will notice is that um, you know, this is all done um, kind of with um, you know, standard unsigned integers and stuff. Um, if you want to do things, uh, you know, with, so what ends up happening is as you like multiply two 8-bit numbers together, you're going to end up with, you know, 16 bits of possible numbers that you could end up with. And so it, it kind of expands and contracts the number of uh, data bits that you can have. And you can look at like uh, the, the red item here on the, on the right where we, we actually, you know, end up using the 9 bits. So it goes above 255 when you add, you know, 196 and 104 together. So that's one thing you need to be aware of if you are going to use this kind of homomorphic encryption is, is just the, the range of the data in order to make sure that you've got enough room for it and you don't have overflows. Okay, so an, another example of this that I found really helpful was from uh, this blog post that I linked here. And, and the idea here is like, okay, so, you know, how could you actually use this in, in practicality? And so... Um, so think of it as like, you know, Bob has a table of stock prices and, and Alice wants to query and say, okay, I want to know the price of a particular stock, but I don't want Bob to know which stock it is that I'm, uh, that I'm querying. So it uh, seems like kind of a uh, unsolvable problem, at least not without you know, just pulling down all of the data. So the, presume, the presumption is, you know, Alice and Bob both have plenty of CPU speed, but maybe not so much uh, bandwidth. So we don't want to pull down, you know, the price of every single stock. But uh, what can happen is that Alice can send a, a, an array, basically, of encrypted values and say, okay, we're going to, um, you know, there's five, uh, there's five possible stocks in this case. So we're going to say, okay, we want to know the, the middle one. So stocks A, B, C, D, E. Um, so what uh, she's going to send is uh, A and B are going to be zeros because we don't care about those. C and D, uh, sorry, C is one and D and E are zeros. And this uh, basically gets encrypted and sent over to Bob. Bob then says, okay, so I've got this data. Bob doesn't know that this is what's happening, but this is what's happening you know, within the encrypted homomorphic encryption system that you know, zero is multiplied by the stock price for, for stock A, for stock B, so forth. And so what you'll see then is that you end up with zeros here because zero times anything is gonna be zero, but you end up with the one stock price for the, the C stock that she was interested in you can then add all those together, um, and it just comes out to what the C price it was because uh, the other ones are zero. But again, he, that's just going to be an encrypted result that then is going to get sent back to uh, to Alice. So it's a, I thought it was a really interesting uh, kind of illustration of exactly how you can use homomorphic encryption in a, in a somewhat practical way. Um, again, this is something that uh, you would have to implement yourself. I'm not aware of any kind of commercial products that implement anything like this. And, and that's for, well... With, with one exception, I suppose. So uh, Microsoft Seal is the, is, does support some use cases, and so, but it's still kind of a research project. I don't know that a lot's been done on it uh, in the last few years, so I don't know if I would uh, put a lot of faith in it as far as a, a, you know, an actual production commercial product or anything. Um, and, and kind of the, the um, holy grail for homomorphic encryption is what they call fully homomorphic encryption, which would allow an, a, you know, basically an infinite number of additions and multiplications to happen uh, on, the, on the data set. But um, 
It's not really practical yet. Um, there's a couple systems, I think, that have been close to that as far as like they um, are research projects that have kind of been proved to be fully homomorphic, but the problem is that they're entirely impractical. So one of the examples was, uh, you know, one of them was like, uh, 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 I think one of the IBM systems that they were working on was about a million times slower. So something that would take like one second on plain text data would take, you know, I think years basically on the cipher text. So it's just the, the factors, even though computers are fast, it still becomes a, a significant problem. So there's really no practical use of this, uh, but it's an interesting concept to be aware of. And, and sometimes that's also helpful too, because uh, sometimes you get developers that hear about something like this, like, oh, we're going to implement this, you know, homomorphic encryption scheme. And I think you, that definitely is an indicator that you need to take a, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, take a pretty good look at what it is that they are building in order to make sure that it's actually, you know, practical and that it's going to actually meet the security needs of what you have. So the last section we have here is what's called queryable encryption. And so this sounds like magic, and it, it kind of is a little bit, uh, at least for right now. So um, queryable encryption is something that um, really is only implemented right, by, right now by MongoDB. So they really, um, they bought another company that um, kind of specialized in, in some of the, the building, building blocks that were needed for this queryable encryption. And so they basically set this up so that you can... Um, you know, encrypt data on the client side, and then it gets sent to the server side. One of the interesting things, they keep calling it fully randomized. Uh, I don't really like that wording, but the gist of it is it's non-deterministic. So you're, you're sending data up to the server. It's not um, uh, deterministic encryption, but you can still run queries on the data. And right now, they just support equality, which is pretty limiting. But they are going to um, basically support range and prefix and suffix and, and substring searches and future releases. So that's a very unique capability that no other you know crypto system has as far as being able to do those kind of operations on, on fully encrypted data. So um, the gist of kind of how that works is that uh, you know again all the all the encryption is happening on the client side. So, and this uh, MongoDB driver can interface with uh, kind of uh, standard uh, KMSs as well, so it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, entirely their uh, key material that's being used. <coughs> but the idea is that the, uh, the, the client side is the only thing that has the keys, both for decrypting the data, but also for encrypting data to be sent up for, for searches. So it's, you know, the, the general picture is very similar to for, uh, to what you would get for, you know, typical field level encryption where, you know, the data is encrypted before it's sent. But what's kind of the, the magic, uh, here is, is how the data is kind of indexed. Um, and there's a, you know, when data, when documents are basically added into the, uh, store, they're added, uh, there's an index that's created to basically where the data, um, that can be used for the, the queries. Um, and then also the fact that it is a non-deterministic encryption. So you can see here that it's searching for, you know, seven HU, blah, blah, blah. And the, the record that it found that matched is, you know, D seven, six B. So there's some, some magic there that's happening as far as kind of how to, it's able to match those, even though they're not the exact same value. It knows that that's where, uh, um, where the data is that the client is searching for. So what they uh, have underneath the hood there is, is what they call structured encryption. Um, so it's, it's a little strange. Um, structured encryption is uh, a more of a general concept, but it's really the, the key innovation as far as what allows them to do this searching here in such a way that they can you know, actually find the data they're looking for. Um, and I, I think I talked about a lot of this other stuff here. Um, one of the things is that you do need to specify when you create the collection you know, which fields are going to be encrypted, uh, but also what uh, query operations you're going to allow. So um, as I mentioned, kind of the magic here is that it's creating indexes in the back end uh, that are encrypted that allow you to, to do the searches on data. And so if you're just going to be doing like equality searches, then the indexes are, are simpler than the indexes that would be required to support something like range searches in this case of integers or prefix, suffix kind of things for strings. So it's, uh, it's very dynamic, but it's also um, can be resource intensive as well. 
Um, so, uh, and then the other big thing with this is, you know, it's, it's implementation details are subject to change. So I, I tried to look to see if I could find some more details on exactly how this encryption works and, and how they are planning to do some of this other stuff. But because they've only implemented the uh, equality searches so far and they're still planning to um, make changes to some things uh, before they go into the, uh, the allow other types of queries... Um, the, really, the, the alternative was I was you know, going to have to kind of reverse engineer their client to see what was going on. But because the details are subject to change, I think it's best to kind of gloss over those for now. But the gist of it is that you, know, you, you need to make all these kind of decisions up front. So it's really most appropriate for, for new deployments. If, you're, if you've got something that's already using like field-level encryption, then there's not going to be an easy way to migrate that to this because it uh, requires a different set of indexing and, and stuff. It really is kind of, you know, you could pull the data over, but it would be basically creating a new database. So in reality, you know, this is not quite ready for prime time. It's, uh, you know, it's in public preview, but they have said that you should not be using it in production. Um, there will be breaking changes. Um, they've, uh, you know, be because they just, you know, have additional work to do, I think. Um, and, and like I said, it only supports equality matches right now. So it's not, you know, that much more useful than what you already have, uh, available with MongoDB or, or many other different database uh, servers. And, uh, you know, the storage requirements are significant. So the, the five times number I've seen in some places somewhere less. And I think that has to do with, as I mentioned before, you know, what type of querying you're going to support. So the more types of querying you allow, and I think also the larger the kind of data set is, uh, it's going to, you know, basically uh, improve, increase the, the size of, uh, of your data store. And uh, inserts are also significantly slower because basically every time you're inserting a new record into your database, you've got to then update all the indexes that that, um, for that field or any that set of fields maybe that that, uh, that record is for or that the en encrypted fields that that uh, record has. So it's, uh, you know, can be a significant performance uh, impact there when you start getting to, to kind of non-trivial workloads. So I think it's very interesting as kind of a research thing and uh, something that I, I definitely want to keep my eye on in the future, but uh, definitely not something you want to start building any production systems on today. So that's, that's it for me. So I've uh, you know, got a few minutes here, happy to take questions and uh, just throw the information up there again as well. If you want to take a look at our, uh, the offerings that we have for OWASP from uh, Ubic. And uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Um, any questions? <laughs> uh, so on your slide 23, maybe that helps you to, you know, but it says Alice, you know, but doesn't Alice trust Bob here for the, you know, homomorphic encryption process itself is secure? You know, this would only work if this was, you know, third party somewhere else that guarantees that this works, right? Am I missing something here? Well, yeah. I mean, so you have to trust Bob to, um, you know, actually send you the data, I guess, that would kind of come through this process. But the idea is that Bob doesn't get any of the unencrypted data. So it's... Uh, Bob is just going to be receiving the encrypted version of the, you know, 00100 and apply that to the data that he has that uh, may or may not be encrypted already. Yes, so, so that works. But if Bob is in control of that environment as well, then he could potentially see the data. No? Well, he would, he would see the stock prices, but what he wouldn't see is which stock price that Alice was interested in. So okay. you think of Alice as a, you know, a, a private equity person or something that, you know, might want to buy a whole bunch of some stock. So it's, it's a way to kind of avoid kind of an information leak. Okay. And then the next one is this on MongoDB queryable. I know you mentioned that there is this research from Microsoft that isn't, you know, 100% there or, or at all, but they have something called safe computing environment. Is that an alternative to that? Because you can have data there and then query it from the outside without actually seeing the data or something like that. Is that similar or not? You know, or not? Yeah. I, um, Thanks, by the way. I, it's a, it's, I think that's a different kind of technology around um, basically kind of secure enclaves as far as kind of how, uh, how you can process data. And there's, there's other things that uh, um, some of those uh, cloud vendors and that offer around, uh, they call it like obfuscated RAM and things like that as well. 
Um, I didn't get into those here. I was thinking more at the application layer, but yeah, there's definitely kind of other options out there that give you kind of different levels of security. The, the concern that I have with some of those things is like, you know, if it depends on your threat model. So uh, I kind of view some of it like, you know, S3 uh, bucket encryption, for example. Like, you know, it's, it's useful for like protecting you against somebody like stealing a disk out of Amazon's data center, but it's not so useful in production because usually the thing is running and the data is, you know, accessible by authorized people. So, you know, I think there's sometimes uh, some of that stuff is more um, good for checkboxes, I guess, and just be able to say that data is encrypted, but not really uh, being practical, I guess, as far as actually preventing the types of threats that uh, you should probably be concerned about. Mm -hmm. No problem. Anyone else? Three, two, <laughs> one. That's it. Thank you very much. It was a very really nice talk, and this is it. Um, our last talk of the day. Yep. Yeah, thank you guys very much.